Franklin Prison is located in Durham. It opened in 1983 and is a Category A prison. Today we are taking a look at Franklin Prison's most notorious former and current inmates. 1. Kieran Patrick Kelly Kelly was born in Ireland and at 18 joined the British Army. He was discharged. He moved back and forth from Dublin to London. By 1960 he decided to stay in London. He married and had children and worked in construction but his marriage broke down and he then became homeless. Kieran Kelly suffered with mental health issues and alcoholism and spent some time at Broadmoor Hospital. He was arrested for petty theft in 1983 and while in a police holding cell attacked another homeless man, William Boyd, and took his life. In taped confessions to London police, Kelly claimed to have taken the lives of a dozen people over the course of 30 years, using some methods such as pushing them in front of trains. If Kelly's claims were to be true, he would have been one of the most prolific serial killers ever active in the United Kingdom and the one of the few known or claimed Irish serial killers. In 1984, Kelly was convicted of the 1983 manslaughter of William Boyd and the murder of another homeless man in 1975, Hector Fisher. He served his time in Franklin Prison but he was moved to Durham Prison, a Category B, where he died in 2001. 2. Peter Sutcliffe Peter Sutcliffe, also known as the Yorkshire Ripper, was an English serial killer who was convicted of murdering 13 women and attempted to murder seven others between 1975 and 1980. In January 1981, he was arrested for driving with false number plates. He was then questioned about the murders. Sutcliffe confessed, saying that the voice of God had sent him on a mission to kill. At his trial, he pleaded not guilty on the grounds of diminished responsibility, but he was convicted on a majority verdict. The way the West Yorkshire Police handled this investigation was critiqued heavily. Peter Sutcliffe was interviewed nine times in the course of their five-year investigation. In 1984, Sutcliffe was transferred from prison to Broadmoor Hospital. In August 2016, it was ruled that he was mentally fit to be returned to prison and he was transferred to Franklin Prison. Age 74, Sutcliffe died from diabetes-related complications in 2020. There is one officially suspected murder and plenty of other cases that the police are investigating that could link back to Peter Sutcliffe. 3. Michael Stones 63-year-old Michael Stone was convicted of the 1996 murders of Lynn and Megan Russell and the attempted murder of Josie Russell. Stone's criminal history goes back to when he was a child. He was in the care system and once he left, he became an addict. He served time in prison for drug offences, burglary and assault. He became a known person in Kent's criminal underworld. He was sentenced to two years imprisonment for attacking a man and then received a four and a half year sentence for attacking a friend while they slept. He served a 10 year sentence for robbery, the motive being that the things he stole he would sell for his addiction. He was released from prison in 1993 but suffered with mental health issues and was under supervision from the National Probation Service. He had been sectioned before and had medication but because of his addiction problems his needed medicine was compromised. He is suspected of having killed a man who was found in a park in Maidstone in 1976, the motive being robbery. He's known to have accidentally killed his partner of an overdose, and he was also questioned about the death of a friend who fell under a London tube train as he stood next to Stone. But on the 9th of July 1996, in a country lane in Kent, Lynn Russell, aged 45, her two daughters, six-year-old Megan and nine-year-old Josie, as well as their dog Lucy, were walking home from a swimming gala 
when they were attacked. Lynn, Megan and their dogs Lucy's life was taken during this attack. Josie survived and made a recovery. In the week after the murders, Stone was known to have carried out a robbery in Gillingham near to where the murders took place. Police arrested Stone for the crimes after tip-offs resulting from a reconstruction on the television programme, Crime Watch. Two nursing staff and a psychiatrist, as well as other medical workers, who had seen Stone before the attacks, reported their suspicions, saying that just five days before the murders, Stone was becoming increasingly enraged and had aggressively threatened to kill people. He also threatened his probation officer with a hammer the same weapon that was used on the Russell's murders. Stone had no alibi for the day of the murders, saying he could not remember where he was and told the police he had never even heard of the area. But his friends testified that he knew the area like the back of his hand. Police also discovered a lawnmower that had been stolen from a cottage on the same day of the murders, just 200 to 400 yards away from the scene. There were a lot of witness statements. One woman who was driving on the road said they'd seen a man come out of a bush in a beige car. Another witness recounted driving past a man acting strangely, not in a vehicle, but holding a hammer. A third witness also testified seeing a beige car parked by bushes nearby. At the time of the crime, Stone did not own a beige Ford, he owned a Toyota and there were no records saying that he was an owner of a beige car like the witnesses had seen. Although his friend said he did once drive a beige car. The only witness who is known to have definitely seen the attacker is surviving victim Josie Russell. She maintained that the attacker had been in a red car and Stone himself said that he had owned a red car. A full DNA profile was compiled from the hairs found at the scene by police, but no match was made with any known person. It's not known for certain whether the hairs belonged to the attacker, as they could have got onto the girls' clothing when they were at the swimming gala. The day after the attack, friends noticed that Stone's clothing was bloodstained and he refused to go into their home. They also noticed bloodstains on his toolbox and his car and on a blue sweatshirt. Stone claimed this was a result of him being in a fight, although no marks on Stone were seen. Shortly after this, his friends alleged that Stone removed the bloodstained items from his car and changed his clothes. He later told police that he burnt the clothes. At his original trial in 1998, Stone pleaded not guilty. His conviction was based on the testimony from a witness, Damien Daly, who claimed that Stone had confessed to him while in prison during a conversation for a heating pipe at the back of their cells. Two other prisoners, Mark Jennings and Barry Thompson, also testified at his trial that Stone had suggested to them an involvement in the crime. As a result, the conviction was based upon alleged cell confessions to Damien Daly because there was no forensic evidence linking Stone to the Russell's crime. The case was otherwise based on circumstantial evidence. The jury took nearly 15 hours over two days to find Stone guilty by a 10 to 2 majority verdict. The Court of Appeal ordered a retrial on February 2001 after two out of the three prisoners had their evidence discredited. Within 24 hours of the first trial, Barry Thompson admitted that he had lied and he retracted his evidence. It was also found that the second prisoner, Mark Jennings, had been paid £5,000 by the Sun newspaper and promised a further 10000 before he gave his evidence, so his statement was also deemed unreliable. Stone was convicted a second time in 2001, the jury taking less time than in the first trial to find him guilty. Stone appealed again in 2004, with his lawyers claiming Daly's testimony was unreliable. This second appeal was rejected in 2005. 
On the 21st of December 2006, a High Court judge decided that Stone should spend at least 25 years in prison before being considered for parole. Stone's legal team have argued that Levi Belfield could be responsible for the killings. However, Belford has an alibi, as his partner at the time, Joanna Collings, insisted that she was with him on the day of the murders. This year, Belfield's lawyer claimed that Levi Belfield had admitted to the murders during a conversation with a prison psychologist. Stone's lawyer declared that a signed confession by Belfield had been handed over to the CCRC. In July 2023, the CCRC announced that Stone's case would not be referred to by the Court of Appeal as there was no real possibility that the court would overturn his conviction. However, this month, the CCRC announced that it would be conducting a fresh review of Stone's case. 63-year-old Michael Stone still serves his time in prison today. 4. David Fuller 68-year-old David Fuller was convicted in 2021 of the murders of Wendy Neal, 25, and Caroline Pierce, 20. In 1987 in Kent, months apart, he broke into their homes and took their lives. They were known as the Bedsit Murders. The killer's DNA had been known since a cold case review in 2007, and an analysis of the samples in the two cases later proved that the murders were committed to the same unidentified person. Fuller was identified in 2020 when a match was made between his DNA and the samples from the cases. When finally apprehended, Fuller also received 12 years for incidences he committed in a mortuary while working as an electrician in hospitals nearby in Kent and Sussex. He was sentenced to life imprisonment with a whole life order on the 15th of December 2021. He will serve his life sentence without the possibility of parole in Franklin Prison and that is where 68 year old remains today. 5. Peter Chapman 46 year old Peter Chapman was first investigated at the age of 15 and four years later, he received a seven-year prison sentence for aring two women. He was released in 2001 and had eventually fallen off the police's radar. Chapman used a fake Facebook profile impersonating a teenage boy to befriend Ashley Hall, who was 17 years old. He was actually a 33-year-old man living in his car. She met him on the 25th of October 2009. According to the prosecution, when she met him on the 25th of October, he kidnapped her and then took her life. He posed as Peter Cartwright. He had tried to meet a 15 year old before, but she fled when she saw him. This time he told Ashley his dad was picking her up and unfortunately this worked. He drove around for hours after taking Ashley's life, but was arrested for having no insurance. Once in the cells, he confessed. After the case, it was found he was on the register, but the police didn't check in with him. He never informed them of his whereabouts and roamed around the country freely. He was charged with the murder and sentenced to serve at least 35 years. And that is where he is now. The 46 year old serves his time in Franklin Prison. Thanks for watching. Until next time.